Hey, so I don't know if uh, many of you guys know this or not, but suicide is currently the leading cause of death for veterans with 22 veterans a day who commit suicide. Um, within the military and combat arms, um, we have kind of like a code and an ethos, and it's called the silent professional. And the silent professional basically is you go to your job, you go to war, you come home, and you never talk about it again. Um, and part of that is because it's very difficult when you get home for us in our current American society to make decisions and then reflect on split-second decisions. So it's very difficult to talk to that, to people who haven't been there, I guess. Uh, in addition, many of us often downplay our experiences and say, this person had more combat, that person did more heroic things, that guy had a worse deployment, somebody else had worse injuries, and so on. We frequently downplay our experience, refusing to validate our own struggles because somebody had it worse than us. Ironically, in my opinion, this silence is what creates such a large suicide rate. Many guys don't realize that going to talk to a counselor is not violating the silent ethos or assign a mental weakness. Even the strongest people struggle at times, and a strong person realizes when it's time to ask somebody for help. Although I wrote a book about some of these stories, I still embrace the silent professional mentality, and it's still hard for me to talk about them publicly because I feel as though I'm breaking this code. In fact, this PK is the first time I've spoken about it publicly, and I'm hoping to help other veterans and their families. <laughs> All right, Bob. So no shit, there I was. Afghanistan, 2014. At our peak, we were conducting air assault missions and raids in the middle of the night, and we dodged rockets and machine guns during the day. I realized my mortality when one of my best friends was struck by a Taliban vehicle in an unexpected ambush. When they weren't shooting at us, we were finding their IEDs with our trucks. I was 21 years old. When you come home, you miss war. You miss being surrounded by men who would give their life for you and you for them. You miss the person you used to be before war, and you miss not having to sit face the door at a restaurant or coffee shop, scanning every person for guns and suicide vests. Most of all, you miss being a part of something bigger than yourself. At first, being home was a honeymoon. I went to Cancun, drank margaritas on the beach all day, and climbed ancient ruins. A silver lining came when I met a woman named Peyton, who made me for the first time want to get married. She made me feel like every hardship, wrong turn, pain, and time spent away from home makes sense, because the path led me straight to her. After about 15 months of dating, Peyton and I decided to start somewhere new, so I moved to Bozeman last year ahead of her. After several months, she came out to visit, telling me she wanted to have a life together. A week later, I received a text. She was moving on with her life without me, and she expected for me to do the same. Slowly, I began to realize that I left the war, but the war never left me. The breakup with Peyton compounded when several of my friends commit suicide. My drinking spiraled out of control, nearly a gallon per week, roughly. As the perfect storm brewed, I had a dream I was in the Himalayas, climbing a mountain to leave several little mementos, and the next morning I booked a flight to leave for Nepal three weeks later. After 19 days of walking, I found myself at Imjate. I realized on the final ascent, nearly 1,300 feet with a 70 to 80% slope, when the guide pulled out two ascenders and ice axe, scissoring up the line, that I was duped. Don't worry, I made it to the summit 20,305 feet. I borrowed his ice axe, digging a hole. I pulled out the picture of my wallet of Peyton and I in the ring. Holding on to them, wishing things were different, I buried them beneath the icy snow. Standing up, I felt winded. I could feel gurgling in my lungs as, I, as a drunk kind of haziness fell over me. I realized I was in the beginning stages of high altitude pulmonary edema and cerebral edema from the exertion of not having the proper equipment. I looked at the guide and instructed we descend immediately back to base camp where emergency altitude medications were. After getting to base camp, I was confused, out of breath, and it took me an hour and a half to pack five things in my backpack. I knew I was in trouble then, so I paid the guide 130 American do dollars and a bottle of water, roughly American cents, so it was quite a bit of money, uh, to get me back to Chikung at 17,000 feet by sunset. He nodded and said, no problem. As we walked, my pace was slow. I was disoriented, and I struggled to keep up. I bent over, coughing so hard I was vomiting, induce, inducing a vicious cycle of cough, vomit, cough, until I began coughing up bloody foam from my lungs. After 20 minutes, I looked up and he was gone. I was confident I'd get myself back, though. I simply needed to head due north to get back to the river. As I reached the top of the second hill in the glacier, everything looked the same. There wasn't vegetation at this altitude, and it was so dark I could no longer see Everest, my guide point. I could see, however, that it was 18 degrees and a whiteout storm was blowing up the valley straight towards me. At that moment, I heard the sound of a cassette tape running out of tape and the words of an old training sergeant, gentlemen, if you're ever lost and separated from your unit, stop moving, dig in, and get in your sleeping bag before the dew point hits or you'll die from exposure. Looking behind me, the trail markers are gone. They were never there. 
I was lost for the first time in my life, disoriented and hallucinating. This was not good. Realizing I was running out of time, I say a quick prayer. All right, Big J, I need you to hook me up or I'm dead. And about 20 minutes later, I found a rock, and I heard my old sergeant, once again, steal, take out your Arc'teryx jacket, waterproof pack cover, take some rocks and make a roof. So I did it. Take all your loose layers of clothing off, put all of your layers and socks on, and take your down jacket out, put your feet inside, zip it up, and tie the arms around your feet so you don't lose your feet when you go hypothermic. Crawling into the rock, the only position I could fit into was laying backwards. The fluid in my lungs filled toward the top, and I panicked, realizing I was drowning in my own fluids in a confined space. I tried to stay awake, fearing a shock-induced coma. Steel, prop your head above your lungs, or you'll drown when you go unconscious. I followed his command, blacking out into hallucinations. On Peyton Street, we had just broke up, and I was dropping her stuff off. She runs after me, jumping in my arms. I love you, I just can't be with you. We weren't ready for each other, and we both have a lot to learn. I begin to feel the icy wind blowing the street and leaves past us. Grabbing as tight as I could, she too begins to disintegrate from my arms, from her feet to her head like sand hourglass until she's gone. Back to reality, I'm violently shivering in the rocks, with snow blowing sideways with the wind when I hear footsteps crunching in the snow. As the footsteps get closer, the rocks in my body get physically hot, and I quickly realize the footsteps are just a hallucination, just like I'm not really warm. With one last thought of clarity, I know I'm on the brink of stage four hypothermia and paradoxical undressing. The next morning, I knew I had five days of emergency medications to get me back to the hospital in Lukla. Looking back, there was another hospital closer, but I was delirious. Getting to Lukla five days later, it was dark. I didn't know where the hospital was, and I was getting black spots in my vision. My throat was closing off, and I was struggling to fight the tunnel. At the end of the town, I saw four eight, 10 year old kids. I began throwing rocks at the window, mouthing the words, hospital, help me. Two kids came running out. Um, two of them went running up the hill, while one grabbed each arm, dragged me into the darkness. Realizing the two left me and I was losing consciousness, I accept the fact that I made all this way to die in the street. As we cover the final distance, I see the hospital closed for the night as I go unconscious near the steps. Coming to, I see a doctor in lights. What you take, get here. How are you alive? I tell him the emergency medications and he asks, you American doctor? Yeah, yeah, I am, I lie. It turned out I had a fever over 105 degrees and I had a double lung infection that induced septic shock and a blood oxygen percentage of roughly 37%. The doctor was amazed I was alive and strongly suggested I fly home. <laughs> After the doctors left, I texted my parents. Hey guys, I'm in the hospital, but I'm okay now. It was a close one. My dad responded, son, did you find what you're looking for? Yeah, dad, I did. I realized what I was looking for was never lost at all. My focus was simply too narrow and I couldn't see that's been in front of me this whole time. For those of you who are suffering in silence, who have never told anybody that you're at the end of your rope, barely hanging on, I'm talking to you. I want those who feel as though nobody cares whether they live or die or those who feel there's no hope left to know that I care you're alive. I may not know you or have met you, but I see the potential in you and how much you have to contribute to this world. Despite what social media might tell us, none of us are perfect, life isn't perfect, and we've all said or done things in our life that make us cringe at the thought in retrospect. In our lives, there's mountains and there's valleys. Taking your life doesn't make things better. All it does is take away our ability of ever seeing it get better, and I promise you it will. Sometimes you just need to set out into the unknowns of the world, crawl into a rock, and brave the storm to get to the blue skies and morning light, because sometimes you find your destiny on the path you took to avoid it. <laughs>